We've had a number of topics to talk about today. Uh, we're now moving into the contemporary world, and I thought it might be worthwhile looking at the toolkit that John Grant very kindly provided for us 350 years ago, which we still use as a sort of the, the, our kit for looking at mortality change. Life tables, sex differentials, cause of death analysis, trend analysis, uh, classification of cause of death, and use of administrative data. I'll be using all those. Let's start off with his, as he's, as he's offered his main contribution, uh, life tables. As a species, we really can't live much below a life expectancy of 20 years. Not enough women survive through and have enough children for them to have at least one daughter that, that survives themselves. So our floor is at least 20 years life expectancy. By about the start of the 20th century, and there are people alive today in Britain who were born at the beginning of the 20th century, and the great majority of deaths occurring now are to people who were born in the first half of the 20th century. Um, life expectancy was about 45. It hadn't changed very much, as, as John has pointed out, um, but it then accelerated through the first half of the 20th century before turning off in the second half. So we're now looking at life expectancies at birth of around 80 years. So having gone from 20 to 45 in two million years, we've suddenly gone by another 35 years in the last 100, which you know, is a really remarkable uh, turnaround and one which we really should be strongly uh, praised. But what exactly were the components of that change? Well, we can break down these uh, life changes in life expectancy into those at different age groups. What I've done here is to decompose the increases in life expectancy in 10 year chunks, for men and for women. Um, and that's been by no means uniform. Uh, in the early part of the century, uh, quite high rates apart from the, the 19, around 1930, um, followed by a, a slowdown in the post-war period, but then an increase in the later period. So that at the moment, we're seeing increases of two to three years per decade in life, especially at birth in countries such as Britain. But the, the shading shows how you can just decompose these changes into improvements at different age groups. So in the early years of the, the century, those improvements were very heavily concentrated in infant and child mortality. Infant mortality at the start of the 20th century was not very different from what it was in the middle of the 16th century, as we saw from those, some of those early charts. It was actually higher than some of the, the places like Colleton that was shown uh, earlier on. Um, about 150 per thousand live births. Um, over time, though, the contribution of, of the, the dark end of the spectrum has declined substantially and has been replaced by improvements at, at older ages. So increasingly, now, improvements in life expectancy are dominated by those at older ages. It's only in quite recent periods that one has seen much contribution from improvements in mortality at the oldest ages. So it's in those ages that we're going to look for in the future for improvements in, in mortality. How do these sorts of improvements translate into the experience of, of people? This shows the, the further number of years of life a person can expect to live uh, at any given age by the year at which they reached that age. So for example, in 1920, uh, a man aged 60 could expect to live for about a further 15 years. Uh, by 2010, by about now, that man could expect to live for about 25 years, additional 10 years of life. Indeed, that man would have to be considerably over 70, about 72, before the life expectancy was once more 15 years. Similar figures are for, for women. For example, uh, in 1920, a woman around age 50 could expect to live for a further 25 years. She now can expect to live for 25 years in her uh, mid-60s, around age 64. 
So we've pushed back uh, everyone's expectation of what they might see in the future. This is not um, without its problems. Of course, this is associated with the need, for example, to increase retirement ages to meet the additional costs of retirement, depending, and that is given not possibly by age in years to come, but in some countries now is actually linked to life expectancy so that you can actually make sure that the, the ratio of working to retired life remains reasonably sustainable. Six differentials is something that has, has been mentioned. And although both men and women's mortality has improved over this period, they have not done so in the same way. The pat I mean, at the mo in 1850, the differential was about two years in life expectancy at birth. That increased fairly steadily to a maximum in Britain of just over six years, around 1960, before declining substantially. Um, this pattern is not unique. It's something that I'm going to talk about in more detail later. And, but we need a sort of framework for trying to understand why those sorts of differentials increased and have decreased so rapidly. Uh, one way of approaching this is to look at cause of death analysis. Um, and if we go back to John Graunt, um, we can see that uh, he was a careful and perhaps sceptical uh, user of these sorts of data. Uh, his uh, views on, on the, uh, the searches, the old women's searches, after the mist of a cup of ale and the bribe of a two groat fee instead of one, given them cannot tell whether this emaciation or leanness from a thysis or from a hectic fever, atrophy, etc., or from an infection of the somatic parts. So we may be able to infer from that uh, something about the earlier comments about uh, neural diseases and, and others. Um, so attention to data quality is crucial for useful, uh, meaningful analyses of cause of death data. It would be nice to say that over the last 350 years, we've solved these problems. But cause of death data, even today, are by no means without problems. Um, the most uh, notorious and prolific serial killer in British history was Dr. Harold Shipman, who was convicted in, 19, uh, sorry, in the year 2000. He killed probably well over 200 people, and he certified their cause of death. Of course, he was a general practitioner. There was a, an extremely valuable report produced as a result of that by Dame Janet Smith, where she looked in some detail at the whole process of death registration. Um, and users of the data, I think, would be well advised to, to look at that report in, when they're using uh, cause of death data. A number of recommendations for improvement of the system were made, but these are, have not yet been implemented, although there is some expectation they will happen by 2015. The reason for this, unfortunately, is cost. Proper certification of death is, is not without its cost, and that is a major problem in introducing a new system whereby uh, all deaths will be subject to uh, strict medical examination. But we have to use what we've got, and clearly cause of death data have improved substantially over time. So this gives some information on the latest period of the main cause of death. I'm sorry, there's a slight error in, in some of the... Um, the tape and the, the um, uh, sorry, the, let's get the, uh, the, sorry, the codes at the bottom of the, the small cause of death. But I'm going to I'm only talk about the, the main ones. The main cause of death for both men and women in Britain is ischemic heart disease. Um, although there's been a very substantial reduction for both men and women, even over such a small period as 10 years in terms of those uh, classified as dying from those diseases. For men, lung cancer remains the second main cause of death, uh, followed by strokes. For women, um, what's particularly notable is the very rapid increase in the last 10 years in the number of deaths due to dementia and Alzheimer's disease which is now for women the second main cause of death. This reflects clearly an increase in nervous system diseases, but also it reflects the fact of change in coding practices. 
Now, Alzheimer's disease did not exist as a, as a cause until very recently, and over time, the propensity of people to um, code it has actually improved. So there is useful information in cause of death, but it's not itself without its problems. Another area that um, we can uh, thank John Grunt for really was, I suppose, introducing the idea of epidemiologic transition. In one of his uh, bills of mortality, he pointed out that uh, of the 230,000 uh, deaths that he, he uh, examined, um, he said that 50,000, or about two in nine, were acute diseases, uh, and that of about uh, 70,000 died of chronic diseases. It's interesting that that terminology appears to have remained intact over 350 years. So although we don't have teeth and other codes for dying, certainly acute and chronic are still very much part of our vocabulary and underpin much, I think, the discussion about how mortality has changed over the, the intervening period. Um, and so again, he makes this, this very clear link between uh, living conditions and chronic diseases in particular, linking uh, chronic diseases very much, as he says, to the ordinary temper of the place, so that upon the proportion of chronic diseases seems to hang judgment of the fitness of the country for long life. And I think, again, that is something which uh, resonates with current thinking. If one uses a sort of epidemiological transition framework to look at cause of death, uh, this gives a bit more detail about some of the main causes of death uh, within different age groups and trying to use a rather sort of simple classification of colour coding so that we have the, um, the chronic causes in blue, things like um, lung cancers, uh, cirrhosis, etc. Um, we have the, uh, the accidents and violence and we then there are but a distinct lack of infectious diseases. The, um, the external causes tend to be concentrated among young groups in particular, where of course the chronic diseases are uh, tending to be very much dominated by uh, the older age groups, uh, not only cancers, but also the circulatory system diseases. And uh, that sort of pattern as mortality shifts to older ages, of course, the importance of these, these diseases uh, also increases. Um, ageing is another major issue. I think John Grant's uh, contribution should be um, uh, recognised. Uh, there is only one cause of death at old ages, and that is old age, is a sort of uh, well-cited phrase. And uh, he, this is presumably somebody who has um, rephrased again Grant's work. In the case of a man of 75 years old, died of cough, uh, of which, had he been free, he might have possibly lived to 90. I esteem a little error. If this person be in the table of casualties, reckoned among the aged and not placed under the title of coughs. Um, the code uh, old age is still acceptable in current uh, cause of death coding for anyone aged 70 or over. It's discouraged uh, partly as a, as a result of the, um, the sort of the, the shipment report, but it, it is available even though, of course, uh, 70 is now uh, relatively uncommon in terms of death, which are tend to be concentrated at considerably older, older ages. So um, we haven't moved that far that we still uh, regard an age of 70 as making you eligible for dying of old age, uh, even though, as we saw in the earlier chart, we've tried pushed up those the perhaps the effective uh, old age by at that time about 15 years uh, in terms of the further expectation of life you might expect around these sorts of ages. Um, he also uh, was able to extract useful information about population aging. Uh, he talks about um, you know that the the healthiness of the air, the sea coals, and the, the, those other uh, hazards, um, and which affected the overall population uh, mortality. But he was also able to make uh, a judgment about 
what uh, sort of patterns one might expect to see. And that he came to the, to, that the proportion of the aged was about one to 15 or 7%. That's pretty good. I mean, our best estimate, for example, at the beginning of the 20th century was that about 5% of the people would be regarded as, as old, 65 and over. So um, again, perhaps a very, uh, he was uh, many generations beyond his uh, time in terms of these sorts of insights. There are some issues, I think, which have become more important since that time, though. One is the whole issue of inequalities in health. And mortality is the main indicator that's used here. If one wants to add to the name of Grant in terms of the development of these sorts of ideas, William Farr, I think, must also have a major contribution to make. The introduction of vital registration in 1837 meant that we were able to get better information uh, on uh, mortality. And later in the beginning of the 20th century, the introduction of things like social class introduced, ironically, originally, not to look at differentials in mortality, but actually differentials in fertility because of the concern about the um, disproportionate breeding of lower social classes in relation to their, their betters, but nevertheless has proved invaluable for analysing mortality differentials since then. And the extent of mortality differentials has been recognised for at least 150 years since we had data available uh, from vital registration. Chadwick report referred in 1841 to the fact that labourers and apprentices, average age at death, was less than half of that of gentlemen in Bethnal Green. Um, we've been very good at analysing inequalities, but these persist. And this shows, for example, life expectancy at age 65 for men, um, according to the latest socioeconomic classification in the last 25 years or so. Um, over time, uh, all, all the groups have tended to uh, improve uh, life expectancy from, but however, the, the ratio, the percentage improvement and absolute numbers have differed between the groups. So that, for example, over that roughly 25 year period, um, higher managerial and professional workers uh, increased by 3.6 years or 24%, whereas the routine workers increased by only 2.4 years, a third less, and an increase of 19 rather than 24%. These uh, differences uh, are also seen at the geographical level with um, the lightest mortality being uh, largely concentrated in the southern half of England. All the worst areas of mortality are concentrated uh, above a line from the Severn to the Wash, apart from uh, a few boroughs in the, say, the east, eastern part of inner London and a few of the Medway towns. Uh, not only that, there is a disadvantage of poorer people living in poorer areas. So there's a penalty not only for being disadvantaged as an individual, but you get an added penalty in addition to that if you live in an area with other disadvantaged people. OK, well, that sounds rather perhaps gloomy. Um, governments have been attempting for many decades to address the issues of, of inequalities. Um, there have been a number of reports. We're very good at analysing the issue, but as these data show, we've perhaps not been as successful in actually overcoming them as we might have been. Nevertheless, one, there is a considerable grounds for optimism in terms of what may happen in the future. And I suppose for many of us, uh, it's more of interest to, to us how long we're going to live rather than how long we've already lived. I mean, the future is really what, what uh, is crucial for individual and possibly even for policy purposes. And this is a quote from Ian Diamond, who was chief executive of the ESRC, uh, who was a, a, sort of a second hand, uh, well, a removed sponsor of, of this event. And he pointed out that in the UK, life expectancy at birth has been growing, you know, around two years every decade for males, 
which is the fastest in, in the world, and that the anticipation is that British males could become the world's livest longing, longest living men in a few years from now, which may be of some comfort to uh, the audience here. So I'm going to try to put a, this into a bit more international context now and show some uh, comparative data taken from the WHO database. These are the, the latest um, values uh, for the uh, EU countries uh, in this period. We can see that um, in terms of um, male life expectancy, uh, Britain is uh, at the, the top end of the, of the distribution. It's up there with, with places like, like Spain and the Netherlands uh, and Norway, but uh, still below um, Iceland, Sweden and Italy and Switzerland. Uh, British women actually do rather worse in terms of, of league tables. Uh, for people who are not British residents, there is a tendency in Britain to think of everything in terms of league tables. Um, and this is yet another example, I'm afraid, of our um, knee-jerk reaction to, to uh, pre data presentation. Um, so uh, British females uh, tend to be there in, in, with countries like, like Germany, uh, but well below the Southern European countries, um, Italy, Spain, plus France, Switzerland, and the, the Scandinavian countries, indeed the Nordic countries, in the case of women as well. So, sorry. Um, so what about the expectations um, uh, of what may happen into the future? There is still considerable um, controversy about what may happen. I won't say too much about this because I'm sure that the... Uh, subsequent speakers will, will um, elaborate on this. But there is, um, you know, a range raising from, you know, life expectancy at birth and older ages could, could level off or even decline within the first half of this century. Paper in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, very recently, and one by uh, Jim Pell and colleagues in The Lancet uh, slightly later, say most babies born to 2000 in countries with long life expectancies will celebrate their 100th birthdays. So there is a, um, a range of, of uh, possibilities that one may need to look forward to. In terms of what's been happening in, in Britain, this is quite a simple presentation showing the annual percentage improvement in mortality. It's the standardized death rate uh, over the period since the middle of the 19th century. In general, the improvement in, the, in mortality through to the middle of the uh, 20th century, I mean, there was obviously um, various fluctuations about that, but it improved from a negative value initially up to uh, an improvement of about 1% a year. Since then, if anything, the improvement has accelerated in more recent years. So now we're looking for men in particular, seeing of about 3% per annum in terms of mortality, which is historically unprecedented. Um, for women, the rates of improvement are now slightly lower than for men, having been higher than for men in earlier decades. I've also um, put on there the values implied by the latest uh, projections, which suggest the improvement in mortality will decline to about a level of about 1.2% improvement per annum in the long term. Um, I'm going to look at these in more detail at separate age groups, and I'm going to concentrate in particular at, at adult ages. Um, for those people who are familiar with these, this presentation, this is a heat map which shows the percentage rate of improvement in mortality uh, at each age um, in each year in the period since 1920. Uh, the diagonal lines represent cohorts. Um, so what one can see is that uh, in particular, what I think noteworthy is this pattern here, um, where you can see that uh, high rates of improvement are seen among people, tracing them back 
born around, around 1930, and similarly for women. For other groups, for example, those born in the 1950s, much lower levels of improvement, indeed, in, for men in young adult ages, some actual, actual deterioration in mortality over that period. So what one would like to, to be able to try is get some insight in, in, into the processes. These groups are called, um, sometimes called the golden cohorts, cohorts who've had, who appear to have particularly rapid rates of improvement compared to cohorts on either side of them. Um, and these, there are very explanations for why one might see this sort of uh, effect. One would be smoking patterns, which Les has mentioned earlier, better diet, uh, people born in low birth rate uh, generations, face less competition in labour force, in, in, in home, in education, uh, welfare state, and medical advances. So there's a range of, of reasons which might account for this. We're looking into the future, and this shows, uh, the, again, the official projections, what they anticipate in terms of cohort life expectancy rather than period expectancy from now on. So this is for people born in 1850, improvements through to 1900, an acceleration in improvement from 1900 moving up through to 1950 for both men and for women. I've put this in shaded because for not, from 1950, these are people who are now aged about 60, and what's going to happen to them is clearly very much dependent on what happened into the, in the future rather than the past. So these must be regarded as more speculative. But what one sees here is apparently a fairly rapid decline in the rate of improvement in mortality compared to what we've experienced in the past. And the question is, what sort of explanations are, are there for that, including uh, these well, sex differentials here, narrowed, widened considerably, and narrowed again. And this is, I think, where smoking, you know, does contribute to the explanation. Um, in, say, 2000, Smoking was responsible for about uh, 60,000 deaths, I think, in England and Wales. Of those um, smoking-related deaths, of people who died from lung cancer, about 90% of them died from smoking. From people who died of, uh, for example, respiratory and vascular diseases, about 10% of deaths were due to smoking in those causes. Of smoking deaths, about, one th about a quarter to a third were due to lung cancer. About a third were due to circulatory system diseases and about a third were due to respiratory diseases. So those are the three broad causes which smoking tends to lead to mortality work by um, Peter and Lopez. So does smoking provide any explanation for the patterns that we've seen in Britain in the 20th century? And firstly, there is a strong cohort effect for smoking. It's tempting to say, look at smoking prevalence and mortality, but it takes 30 or 40 years for the effects of smoking to be translated through into, into mortality. The peak in smoking and the peak in smoking rate of mortality tend to be, you know, a long time apart. So it's really looking at smoking patterns well in the past that will determine current levels of mortality. And it is the cohort's early experience that determines their mortality. So if cohort approaches produce a, a better basis for looking at the role of smoking on, on mortality, and also more generally looking at the effects of, of cohort patterns. So, what we did uh, in a paper is with uh, Maria Chiara di Cesare was to try to break down mortality in Britain into age, period, and cohort effects. 
and this, there are a variety of approaches used to do this. What we did was to use an approach uh, by Bendix Carstensen, where one tries to decompose mortality at any age, year, and year of birth into mortality at a given age, multiplied by a relative risk associated with being in a particular cohort, and a relative risk associated with being in a particular year. For people who are familiar with the, the methodology, there is a problem with uh, age and cohort in that they're not independent. In the jargon, there's an identity problem, which uh, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll leave and talk about later in, in the discussion if people uh, want to um, talk about that. But this is a demographically uh, um, informed model which we need to think about where these patterns of mortality actually appear. So we have to put various constraints on the model in order to get usable results. In this particular case, what we do is to have our age pattern, which is that of a reference cohort. In this case, we take 1900 as the, the, the reference cohort. And this is the all-cause mortality, and we also do the same for lung cancer. So these are our estimated values. The 1900 cohorts, patterns of mortality from all causes and lung cancer. This is the period rate ratio. This is what we adjust it to allow for what year we observe the person in. For, again, all causes of lung cancer. Here is the cohort rate ratio. Now, there is a problem in any of these models in that if there's a general change in mortality, 1% a year improvement, that is not automatically a period or a cohort phenomenon. It's a generalised, in the jargon, it's drift. It could be allocated to either period or cohort. In this case, we allocate that to the cohort component. So our period rate ratio is approximately one, but our, and our cohort rate ratio is fixed to be one at the, at, for the reference cohort, in this case, 1900. So what we've done is to decompose changes in mortality into age, period, and cohort. What's noteworthy about these is that if we do that, these values are very close to one. We are not looking at year-to-year -year fluctuations. We're looking at smooth, smooth trends. We use, in the, in the job, we use a spline function to look at the main patterns over time, taking out the very, sh very short-term annual fluctuations. So we find out, in fact, that most variation in both all-cause mortality and lung cancer mortality can be accounted for by age and cohort only, i.e. the period effect is approximately constant. Uh, now, we're also often interested not in the levels, but in changes. Is it 1% a year compared to 2% a year? We're talking about short-term changes. So, just to go back to our uh, earlier chart, this is what we've got. Our, we've got our age pattern for lung cancer, our cohort effects for uh, males and females, and the period effects, relatively small. We can take that out and we say the main patterns of mortality for men and women can be expressed in terms of the simple cohort factors. So our model simplifies to say that mortality for both all causes and for lung cancer is simply mortality rate at a given age multiplied by a cohort factor since the period effect is, is one. We now make an assumption that total smoking rate of mortality is a simple multiple of lung cancer mortality. The Peter Lopez model indicates that about a quarter to a third of all smoking rate of mortality is due to lung cancer. So we can just use lung cancer as a proxy for total smoking rate of mortality, inflated by some, some fixed value. So what, 
we've done here simply is to then convert these values into the annual percentage rate of change of risk in for all causes and for lung cancer. So we find that, for example, for all cause mortality, that over time, cohort mortality is improving, for example, for men at 3% a year for cohorts born around 1930. These are the so-called golden cohorts, the most advantaged groups. For women, again, those are increasing at a slightly lower rate, 2.5% for the 1930s cohorts. For the other groups, rates of improvement are rather less. For lung cancer, one finds that the rates of uh, mortality uh, improvement in lung cancer, first of all, they're above zero for the early cohorts, i.e. lung cancer getting worse. This is deteriorating mortality, 4% a year for men and women born around 1890. For men around, by about 1930, they're more lung cancer mortality is improving at about 4% a year, women at about 2% a year. So let's convert those from percentage improvements to actual numbers of deaths, convert this into death rates. So what we find is if we can find, we now want the annual change in death rates for males and females for all causes and for lung cancer. And we find that over time, for example, that all cause mortality for men improves more and more, goes, reaches the peak, has a slight change here, reaches a maximum improvement of about 50 to 100,000 in 1930, then starts to improve less for later cohorts. For women, again, slightly different pattern, but again, reaches a maximum improvement here of about um, 10 per 100,000 for, for lung cancer. Sorry, this is for males, lung cancer. Again, for women, maximum improvement uh, around 1930 and maximum improvement in lung cancer roughly at a similar year. If we regress, sorry, those values on those values, we get our fitted values. This shows if we just regress lung cancer change on total change, there's a very clear fit. The regression coefficients are about, about three. If you have multiply lung cancer mortality by about three, you get very similar changes to the overall mortality, i.e. Most of the mortality change in cohorts over the last 50 years can be accounted for by lung cancer. So lung cancer, as an index of smoking mortality, appears to provide a good explanation for those fluctuations. In particular, the very high rates of, Im of improvement in lung cancer of people born around 1930 seem to explain the high rates of improvement in total mortality over that period. Um, so, so, you know, I think in contrast to some other people, I would say lung, smoking has a major role in explaining what's going on. If we, um, you know, control for different patterns of smoking among men and women, we find the underlying rate of mortality improvement over the sort of second half of the 20th century has been about... 1.6 to 1.7 percent for both men and for women and we might regard that as a sort of an underlying rate which we might carry through into the, the next century this century as the sort of the the, the baseline for what we might expect uh, to see mortality improvement i think this also has implications about how far we think that the the improvement in male mortality in britain will continue into the future in part, this is due to the fact that although men and women stop smoking at a reasonably similar age, uh, because the, the pressures, for example, after the, the anti-smoking reports came in, 
1960 led both men and women to move away from smoking, men started smoking much earlier than women did and smoked much more than women did. So that part of the reasons why mortality is improving so rapidly for men in Britain is that they are simply fewer men year by year smoking than they were last year and therefore one's getting the bonus of that smoking effect. That will die off. Rates of smoking among men have declined substantially and therefore one therefore might expect to see the rates of improved immortality among men also declining and tending to converge you know, towards that of women. So um, I'm perhaps less optimistic that uh, UK males will have the highest life expectancy in the world in, in time to come, but uh, it uh, would be a very nice and attractive proposition if, if that were to, to occur. Anyway, simply to, um, to summarise what's happened, uh, at the moment, uh, mortality improving at about 2% per annum. Um, whether that will continue or not is, uh, I say there is some debate about it. Um, that does not seem to be unreasonable long-term assumption for mortality. Infant mortality has actually shown the largest improvements over time and has had the biggest impact on overall mortality change over the 20th century. But uh, in the most recent period, the scope for further improvements in infant mortality is limited simply because rates are so low, it doesn't matter what happens to infant mortality, it will not affect uh, overall mortality to any great extent. It's at the older ages, particularly at, among the, the um, 80, 85 plus group that one is going to look for, for the major uh, improvements. Um, and as I said before, I think smoking, you know, does have a major role to play and, but also may mean that the future may be slightly less optimistic than it would be if one doesn't take account of the fact that some of these results are simply reflecting the, the increase and subsequent decrease in smoking over the 20th century. Thank you.